Welcome everybody to the Trillium Flow Technologies webinar. Today we're going to talk about uh, severe service control valves and in particular we're going to refer to our extreme trim solution. I let, uh, my name is Andrea Beninzeri. I'm the Global Product Director at Trillium Flow Technologies for isolation and control valves. Uh, I let my colleagues Adrian Croft uh, speaking uh, is the product manager for uh, Blake Boro control valves. Uh, those valves are made out of UK facility. So let's hear Adrian uh, driving uh, us through the, our uh, product portfolio. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending when you, where you're listening around the world. Uh, my name is Adrian Croft. Um, for those of you who celebrate Chinese New Year, I wish you all a happy new year. And as Andrea says, I'm going to be talking to you about severe service control valves, and in particular, our extreme trim. So just a quick agenda for what we're going to be talking about today. I can't hope to cover all the subjects on, on severe service. It's quite a long uh, subject matter, uh, but we'll be touching on, first of all, what is severe service, uh, why we need severe service control valves, um, and what the valve options are. There are many different valves that, that define themselves as severe service valves. Um, so we'll look at some of the options and some, some of the valve trim options um, for severe service valves. We'll look in reasonable depth at, at um, severe service trims for liquids. Liquids overall is quite an erosive medium. Certainly if you've got high pressure drops, there are detrimental flow factors such as cavitation uh, that can happen in a liquid flow. So we'll be going through those in, in, in a reasonable amount of depth. One of the advantages that we have as an option is we, we use additive manufacture. So additive manufacture in simple terms is, is 3D printing. So in, in certain applications and in certain trim styles and sizes, we can, we can physically print uh, the trim in metal. So it gives us an advantage in, in terms of uh, lead time. So we'll just be go going through some of the techniques uh, for doing that. We look at velocity control um, and why it's important through a severe service valve. We'll then look at uh, our gas service applications, um, slightly different severe service valve, but, but equally important in terms of reducing noise. And lastly, uh, we'll take any questions. So as, as we said at the beginning, that if you do have any questions, uh, then please feel free to submit them through the question and answer. So before we start on severe service valves, let, let's just think about control valves overall and some of the uh, trim designs that we have. Um, uh, start what we would, term a standard control valve um, has a cage in it quite often. There are more basic control valves, which I'll touch on in a couple of slides time. But for a, a single cage design, like we see here, it can fit in most valve sizes. It's, it's good for, for pressure drops, usually of up to about 50 bar pressure drop. So it's quite versatile. It suits a lot of applications. Um, and then the overall the cage for, for the style has what we call a low pressure recovery. And the reason it has a low pressure recovery is, is that the flow comes through the holes of the cage. It splits and divides into jets. And those jets then collide in the center of the cage, as you see here. And all the energy that's formed by, by the jets passing through the holes impinges together in the center of the cage. And it then simply passes down towards the outlet of the valve. 
So these, as I say, used for approximately 50 bar pressure drop. Um, it varies depending on materials and, and material selection, but on, as a rough rule of thumb, 50 bar pressure drop. From there, the next best style of trim generally, and, and this varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, but in our terms, we have a cascade trim. So the cascade trim is, is simply a series of cages. In the model on the right hand side, we see uh, what we would call a cascade three, which is three cages. Um, so what happens here, th this would typically be used on a gas service application where the flow comes in from the center of the cage and it passes out and expands through the cage. So each twist and turn here, we're dropping the pressure. Now in ter our terms, we call it a cascade three because it's got three cages. But in reality, when we think about pressure drop stages, how many stages of pressure reduction has this got? There's no industry definition of what a stage of pressure reduction is. Um, some manufacturers would call class it each turn through the valve would be a stage. So in theory, that, that trim would have five stages of pressure reduction. So, so no industry definition of, of stages. So it, it uh, kind of muddies the water in terms of how we define a severe service valve. So again, when we think about severe service valves for, for liquid, if initially we think about different types of valves, for example, we've got a ball valve, we've got a butterfly valve, and, and we've got a globe control valve. So why don't we use, for example, a ball valve on, on a pressure drop of, of 200 bar? And the whole reason for that is, is the, that we have a factor which we call pressure recovery. So pressure recovery uh, is really the, uh, the amount of recovery of the pressure once the pressure drop process takes place. So ball valves overall um, have a very high pressure recovery. This means that they have more potential for damage, they have more potential for erosion on high pressure drops, they have more potential for cavitation. So we wouldn't use them on, on very high pressure drop applications, certainly when there's cavitation likely to be present. Um, there are special ball valves with, with uh, multi-stage trims in there. But as a general rule of thumb, we wouldn't use them for, for severe service valves. But fly valves have a slightly lower pressure recovery. But overall, the, the best style of control valve is what we call a globe style control valve. So the globe style control valve has the lowest pressure recovery of, of uh, uh, all types of control valves. So although there are different trim selections that can take place within the control valve, uh, in general terms, a globe valve is classed as the most superior valve on the market. It gives you noise reduction, it gives you cavitation resistance, it gives you pressure drop control, all within the confines of the valve body. But limitations of that, when we, when, again, when we think about a globe control valve, there are many different designs. What we see on this page here is um, some of the basic, more basic globe control valve designs. These ones here are contour plugs. So basically we're achieving control of the process fluid by the shape of the contour of the valve plug. So as the plug lifts up, uh, we're getting control of the fluid through, through that motion. So in relative terms, in, in, in blood control valve terms, these have a higher pressure recovery. They're, they're, they're generally regarded as, as better than, for example, a ball valve. But again, these have higher pressure recovery than other types of valve on the market. When I talk about other types of valve, then these are examples of lower pressure recovery type valve. So 
These are what we call cage guided valves. And in here, again, depending on pressure drop, certain cage valves are better than others. So for example, we have on the left-hand side, we have a ported cage design. So the ported cage design is, is essentially a big slot in the cage. So it has a higher pressure recovery than the drilled hole cage. So I've already touched on our multi-flow cage, with it, which is a single cage, usually good for, for 50 bar unless there's adverse process conditions. Then we've got multi-stage cages. Um, so um, uh, this would be an example of our cascade cage. And a lot of valve manufacturers have these types of products in their valve portfolio. But the pinnacle of this portfolio is the stack disc design of valve trim. So the stack disc design basically allows for uh, more pressure drop stages through the valve. And we'll be taking you through some of these uh, types of design in the coming slides. So multi-stage trims, um, what are the limitations? How do we fit them in the valve body? As I said earlier, the, how do you define stages of pressure letdown? And, and again, there's no industry definition of, of what a stage is. So each valve manufacturer can um, state or market a specific number of stages. In our terms, as I say, the picture that you see here would be a Cascade 3 trim. But what would happen, for example, if we needed more stages, if we needed more uh, sleeves or cages on the valve? Basically, what we would have to do is expand the number of cages outwards or shrink the bore of the cage so, so that the plug gets smaller so we can physically fit an extra cage into the valve body. So in terms of uh, practical terms, then the more cages that we need to fit in the valve, then the more the valve body would have to be expanded outwards. So in practical terms, three stages, sometimes five stages or five cages is the practical limit for a valve body. Otherwise we would have to go to bigger valve sizes. So the trim capacity when we when we use multiple cages or multiple sleeves is, is very limited. Uh, as I say, the valve body limits the physical size of the cage that we can fit in there. Uh, and overall, then this in turn limits the maximum pressure drop control that we can get through the valve. In terms of, of the trim itself, in having 90 degree corners like you see on the picture here, then it's not very good when, when we have dirt or debris in the trim. These 90 degree corners can be areas where, where the trim gets plog, uh, clogged or blocked up. Uh, and equally, the control of velocity is, is not as good as, as other trims. So that, that's a limitation on, on multi-stage trims uh, in terms of, of cylindrical cages. Cylindrical cages overall are, are, are good, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's a case of choosing the right trim for the right application. Another method of installing cages into a valve is, is to elongate the valve body. Uh, what we call axial flow valves. So by elongating the valve body, we can put a, a much, much, much longer trim in the valve. So we can expand the valve trim downwards as we show, show on the picture on the right hand side. In having the picture, uh, in having the uh, plug expanded downwards, we can basically uh, increase the number of stages in the valve plug. So essentially the fluid is twisting and turning inside the valve plug. And as it does that, we get the stages of pressure drop. Again, it has its limitations. Um, quite often these are limited by, to six stages. It can be more, but, but you would 
uh, but the valve body would again be much much longer um, and uh, as a consequence of this design valve bodies have to be very special they have to be much longer designs when you're dealing with exotic materials or more exotic materials such as uh, duplex in canal etc then yeah then long valve body basically leads to high costs so um so essentially this design is is very uh costly to produce um uh and gives you overall poor velocity control and, and limited in terms of pressure drop control so as i say the valve design or the valve trim that gives you greatest flexibility is the stack disc design the the stack discs uh, are versatile um they they uh, are clamped or welded together the the, the uh, actual installation depends on the design you can generate custom flow characteristics through through the valve trim and overall the the trim itself the the stack disc design is at the top of, of what we would term the severe service pyramid but overall um as you'll see in the coming slides not all stack disc design valves are the same they all have different features different designs of discs and this is what i will take you through now uh just as a reminder be, um just uh, in case you've got any questions then then please uh feel free to uh put the questions in the question and answer uh board and that will try and handle these at the end so stack disk technology what is it um so these are examples of stack disk design trims these are produced by our competitors and, and in general terms these are designed with, with twists and turns built into the discs as you see on this bottom disc here the um, flow comes in from the edge from the outer edge of the disc it comes in and it twists and, and turns i'll get these 90 degree turns through to the disc itself um, the the disc or the flow path um, also expands the area and we'll talk about velocity control uh, as we go through the presentations um, and you'll also notice that in terms of the fluid that's going through here the fluid itself has a single flow path so the twists and turns uh, are through a single flow path through the disc although there are there are um eight flow paths through the disc itself so when we start to look at this trim uh we call it a labyrinth trim um different manufacturers have different terminology but in, in our terms we'll just call it a limit uh, a labyrinth trim for the purposes of this presentation so there are a few things to note here um and um the, the first thing to note as i said before is it has a single flow path so as the fluid goes through the valve trim you'll notice it's a single flow path continually passing through the trim until it, it reaches nearly the end and then it then it expands into in this case two single flow paths now if we look at this more closely what we see is that the the flow path forms a natural path through the through the disc and, and through the flow profile so the green area here represents the uh, fluid the blue area represents an area of what we call recirculating flow. So that recirculating flow is essentially spinning round and round um, and, and is, is relatively stagnant within the valve trim. That causes issues with um, uh, potentially cavitation. It can generate cavitation in those corners, but more likely that if there's any dirt or debris in the valve trim, then that dirt and debris would become trapped within the uh, 
trim itself and ultimately block up the trim. The other thing that you'll notice is in turning these 90 degree corners, the fluid then accelerates around the bend in those corners. So we get areas of high velocity and these areas of high velocity can cause erosion of, of these 90 degree corners. So there are certain limitations in, in these labyrinth trims. Our extreme trim, on the other hand, uh, when we looked at the design, we, we looked at the uh, how we could eliminate these 90 degree corners, how we could eliminate the potential for blockage. And we came up with a, a valve trim design that, that is based on a series of cylinders. So these cylinders are uh, give us the flow path through the valve. They have the advantage in terms of, of making the flow path much smoother. So the flow path that gives us a, a much more natural flow path um, through the valve trim. The, in this case, the fluid enters the trim from the outside and it passes through the valve trim uh, and exits um, into the valve center of the valve cage. Now you'll notice here that the columns of the valve trim are larger at the inlet and they're smaller at the outlet of the, of the, of the trim. This again, like the labyrinth trim is, is due to velocity. So in having a smaller flow path through the inlet, then, then we get more pressure drop at the inlet. And as the columns get smaller, then we can reduce the velocity through the valve trim. In having a trim that has a more natural flow path, it means that we can have a higher CV through the valve trim than, than on the labyrinth trim. But as you'll see later on, we, we address issues with aerodynamic and hydrodynamic noise. We address issues with the potential for cavitation and, and pressure drop reduction. So all this is possible with the, with the extreme trim. So when we look at the flow path and, and produce a, a CFD or computerized fluid dynamic model of the valve trim, then what we get is something like this. So, so as I said before, the highest pressure drops will always be at the inlet of the valve trim. This is where the cylinders of the valve trim uh, are at their largest, so, so we get the smallest flow path. But the key thing to note here is that the blue areas are the areas of recirculating flow uh, are kept to the ends of the columns. So in keeping the, the uh, fluids uh, or the recirculating areas to the ends of the columns, it basically means that if any dirt or debris gets into the trim, it will simply wash through the trim. It won't get trapped in any corners of the valve trim. So it has a natural anti-clogging uh, feature through the valve trim. The other thing to know is rather than having a single flow path, the, the, uh, the flows interact together. So when we think about it passing around one of the columns, for example, the flow passes around the column and then collides with the jet at the opposite side of the column. So we get this jet impingement as well as multi-stage pressure reduction. The other thing that we have is, is we get the expansion and contraction of the, of the jets through the valve trim. So as the jets are expanding and contracting and, and impinging together, it gives us a much better interaction and it gives us a much more efficient pressure drop control through the valve trim. So this is, this is just an example of an extreme valve. As I said before, the, the valve fits into a standard valve body. So the, we're, we're basically looking at the trim itself. In the case here, this is a specific design that, that we do for customers with uh, uh, contamination issues in the process fluid. Uh, 
So this design here is clamped together rather than uh, vacuum brazed or, or welded together. So in these cases, the individual discs can be replaced uh, at, at the requirements of the customer. Invariably, it would be maybe the lower two or three discs that, that would need replacing. So it's easy to replace them through this design. Uh, but we do have a fully assembled disc stack as well, which is our standard offer. So, so the valve, the, so the trim itself simply fits into a standard uh, control valve. It can be globe, it can be angle um, as required. So uh, no special features from the pressure envelope. In terms of what we're trying to achieve through the valve trim, um, then what we're trying to achieve is multi-stage pressure letdown. So we're trying to gradually reduce the pressure through the valve trim itself. So on the left hand side, we show the red line here. This represents a single stage of pressure letdown. It represents the pressure recovery that you would get through a single stage trim. So whether that's, that's a ball valve, whether it's a butterfly valve, whether it's the single cage valve, um, they all, as I said before, they all have different pressure recovery factors. And when we're thinking about pressure drop and in particular cavitation control, the important thing is, is to um, not have to, to eliminate pressure recovery below the vapor pressure. This is when a cavitation would occur. So what we would get is multi-stage pressure letdown with the extreme. Um, it's not actually a true line here. We would get higher pressure drops slightly at the inlet, and then the pressure drops would reduce until we eventually reach P2 or the outlet pressure. But ultimately in dropping the pressure, we're dropping it more gradually, where um, uh, controlling the pressure drop we're eliminating that pressure recovery, so we eliminate cavitation fundamentally. The other thing that we do in um, using a multi-stage trim and the extreme trim is we control velocity through the trim. And we'll talk about velocity later. But essentially, instead of having one peak as, as in a single stage trim, where we have a very, very high velocity, the extreme trim in, in having multi-stage pressure reduction, um, it gives us this, this velocity control through the trim. So again, we're limiting the potential for erosion due to velocity. What we can do with uh, specific trims, and, and quite often these relate to power applications, so what we can do is we can manufacture what we call a very stage trim. So we can combine a very stage trim. It could be a very stage cascade. But in the cases here, the, these are very stage extreme trims. So we've combined an extreme trim with a multi-flow trim in this case. So in doing that, and in particular on power, for example, on, on boiler feed water applications, uh, when the boiler drum is empty, we get a high inlet pressure and a very low outlet pressure. And that is the cause of cavitation. So to eliminate that, we would use this valve. Uh, we would use the extreme trim for the lower portion it gives us the, the pressure drop control. And in the higher portion of the trim, when, when the boiler is full, when, when there's virtually no pressure drop, we would simply rely on capacity. And to achieve this, we, we have the, the multi-flow trim. But using this design, in some cases, certainly on, on um, uh, uh, feed water applications, can eliminate the need for an additional valve. So in some cases uh, on HRSG units, for example, they have a 30% valve and a 100% valve. And, and we, in, in this case here, we can combine it into, into one valve body 
Uh, so again, eliminate the, the need for, for uh, a split range control valve. The other advantage here, as I said before, um, in this case, the customer wanted uh, to replace some of the lower discs to change the characteristic of the valve. On the picture on the right hand side, you'll see that the this is a trim that's come out of the valve. It had a linear set of discs on the bottom and we changed the disc stack to, to make it a, um, a more of a bilinear design. So it gave the customer better control of the bottom discs. So it, the customer didn't have to change the valve trim overall. They added an extra trim as a spare uh, and simply replaced the, the lower discs on the trim. So it was a good, good solution for the customer. It was economical for the customer to make the change without incurring huge costs. So just to highlight the fact of, of dirt and debris within the valve trim. So the labyrinth trim, uh, some of the, the issues here are shown on the left hand side. So we've got trim blockage, we've got erosion through the valve trim. And in the case here, this is, this is generally caused by, by uh, debris becoming trapped or erosion through the impact of particulates in the valve trim eroding the valve trim. The extreme trim on the right hand side, as I said before, has a more natural flow path. The um, trim at the top here, you can see has, has sand on the outside. So it has, um, it's allowed the sand to pass through without any blockage to the trim and, and greatly, greatly extended the life of the, of the uh, pre the trim that was uh, fitted previously. So when we compare the two trims here, we've got the labyrinth trim on the left hand side, and we've got the extreme trim on the right hand side. So what you'll notice here, uh, first of all, is that in the labyrinth trim, what we've got is instead of 90 degree corners through the labyrinth trim, then these corners have started to become rounded. Um, so the trim overall has, has lost some of its efficiency. And overall, then this, this trim would start to erode and wear away. The other thing that you'll notice here is, is the bore of this labyrinth trim. So to physically install the number of flow paths within the disc itself, the, the uh, designer needed to, to reduce the bar of the trim uh, to be able to get the capacity. The extreme trim on the right hand side was used in exactly the same application. You'll notice that there's no damage to the trim itself, but you'll notice the bar where the plug runs is, is much bigger within the, within the cage itself. And, and overall, the extreme trim has been proved to have significantly more capacity um, through the trim. So it gives you higher CVs for the same size of valve. Another particular feature of certainly power applications is magnetite. Magnetite can be a huge problem in, in power plants. It can cause uh, blockage of the valve trim. And uh, in, here we see examples of magnetite. Um, you see it on the top picture on the right hand side where, where the magnetite has started to block up the cage holes. And that this cage had to be cleaned out every single year. It had to be drilled out because, because magnetite sticks uh, so firmly. On the picture on the left hand side, this is a valve trim that, that blocks up. Uh, it was actually every two weeks, it had to be taken out of the valve and the user sent the trim back to us to, to do an analysis, do a section through the valve trim. And when we open the valve trim, basically it's filled with, with, uh, with dust through magnetite and, and fully blocked up. <clears throat> 
On the other hand, the, the extreme trim has been used. Um, there's no blockage to the valve trim. Uh, we design it in Inconel, which is an important feature when we're dealing with magnetite. Um, so because Inconel basically is non-magnetic. We can also get plug damage uh, because of the impingement of magnetite as well. So that's an, another important consideration. So the, the, those are trims that, that have been designed for liquid services. Um, so now I'm going to move on to um, additive manufacturing. But again, before I do that, um, we we I just want to remind you to get some of your questions in. I noticed there are some um, questions already in, which I'll uh, take a look at later. Um, so additive manufacturing, um, all the trims that you've seen up to now are produced by a process called EDM, or uh, in simple terms, what's called spark erosion. So spark erosion is a process where, where a tool comes down, uh, it meets the material of a plate, and when it meets that plate, it generates a spark between the two. And as the tool moves around the, um, uh, the disc, then it forms this flow path. So to form each flow, each flow path to, to form the profile on each disc is a, is a relatively long process. So it incurs a, quite a reasonable amount of cost. In doing this also, it has a relatively long run time. So, so, the, um, so, so to produce a single disc take, takes quite a reasonable amount of time. And then also, if you imagine some disc stacks have, have maybe 20 discs, then, then that equally adds to the time. We've also got to assemble the discs and, and stack them together and, and uh, weld them usually in position. So we started looking at 3D printing. And we looked at a process called SLM, and this was back in, in uh, before 2016. And SLM um, is, is a process where we can take powder metal. Uh, when we inject a laser onto that powder metal, it basically welds it all together to form a, a net shape of, 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 in our case, an extreme trim. We've also, since we did this initial um, uh, research, we're, we're now looking at other methodologies of 3D printing. Incredibly, the, the 3D printing world has exploded with different techniques, different types of technologies, different machines, uh, and, and the, the processes have moved on so incredibly quickly, or e even over the past seven years since, since we introduced the extreme trim. So we have been looking at different technologies, but, but for the moment, SLM is, is our method of choice, purely because we, we, we have a complex flow path within the extreme trim. So these, the, this would be a typical disc from an extreme trim. And, and I, I hesitate to say disc because it would be produced as a complete stack. So this would be a section through a complete stack. And, and as I say, it would be produced fully by 3D printing. Now, what we've had to do to, to incorporate 3D printing technology is we've had to introduce these, these bridges, so to speak, within the design. If you imagine that in 3D printing, we've got to stick layer upon layer upon layer of material together, which is good if, if there's something below that layer to stick it to. But where we have gaps, uh, i.e. the flow passages through the valve trim, there's nothing above that gap to be able to stick it to. But by forming these bridges, we, we can form the bridge 
from the outside and start to build it up towards the center. So it gives us this methodology to, to 3D print the valve trim uh, through, through, through redesigning the trim essentially. We can also start to introduce features onto the valve trim. So, so we can start to put aerofoils, for example, on the valve trim. So we can guide the flow into the valve trim to, to transition the flow much more smoothly into the valve trim. So, so it gives us more stable flow. And again, importantly, it gives us lower pressure reduction as, as the fluid comes into the valve trim. So um, if we think about going back to spark erosion, some of the advantages here are, are that we can um, reduce the, the uh, what we call the land on the disc. So by spark erosion, we, we had to physically have a one millimeter thick plate under the, under the columns. This was because we put heat via the spark into the disc. And if we didn't have a one millimeter section, it would warp the disc and, and distort the disc. But by adding this, the uh, 3D printing, we can reduce the layer thickness of the discs. So we can get a bigger flow profile through, through the disc itself. There are, um, issues in terms of, of the, uh, because we're sticking dots and material together, the, the surface roughness is slightly rougher, which does affect the CV, but because we can reduce the, the thickness of, of the land across the disc, then, then essentially, again, we can get more um, uh, flow through, more CV through the disc itself. And overall, again, although the picture here just shows a, a cut through the disc, what we would produce is a single disc stack as shown in the center. This disc stack overall would be, would be fully manufactured uh, through 3D printing. There would be just be a cleaning process just to clean some of the location bores. Uh, but overall, once it's printed, uh, it's completely repeatable, it's completely uh, good to go in a valve as one complete assembly. So selected, uh, SLM, selective laser melting, uh, we can use uh, 316L material, Inconel 718 material, which is hard material. <laughs> there are more materials that are on the market, but the limitation in general is the limitation of the powder that's available. Now, it, it's not to say that the other powders aren't available, but when you set up a machine uh, with one material, for example, 316L, if I wanted to change the material to Inconel 718 to prevent material impur impurities, you physically got to clean the machine and, and that takes up to a day to clean down a machine. So a machine in practical terms is limited by the material that you would use on that machine. But um, by using SLM 3D printing, it allows uh, uh, components to be produced in, in a couple of days uh, rather than weeks. We can fully certify the material um, and, and it gives us a lot of versatility. Now that's not to say that, that 3D printing is always the panacea of, of what, we, what we need. Um, it, the, the cost of 3D printing is essentially how long that component uh, takes to build on a machine. So smaller 3D print runs are much more effective. Uh, smaller uh, material capacities are much more effective uh, because they, they can be printed much quicker. Where we would get a, a um, let's say, a, a, a trim with 400 millimeters diameter, that would be to the limit of the machine. There would be a lot of material on, on that uh, 
uh, this step and the run times might be weeks and, and consequently again you pay for the run time on the machine so it's not always true to say that 3d printing is cheaper it's not always the case but it does give you options uh, for different trends so velocity control let's think about the velocity uh, through the valve trim before i go on again I remind you if you've got any questions uh, please feel free to ask the questions there are quite a lot in at the moment so thank you very much for that so let's think about velocity i mentioned the earlier in terms of pressure drop control and velocity control through the trim but let's just think about it in simple terms if I have, for example, an orifice, I'm passing through a specific flow rate and a specific diameter. In this case here, it would work out at 35.4 meters per second. If I half that diameter to 50 millimeters, my velocity goes up by a factor of four. So half the diameter, the the uh, or half the area, the velocity goes up by a factor of four. So when we're designing the valve trim, we have to be careful of these areas uh, so that we get velocity control through the valve trim. And again, going back to the labyrinth design trim, the labyrinth design trim has a single flow path. And you see on the pictures on, on the bottom of the screen, that the labyrinth trim um, gradually expands the flow area. So by expanding the flow area, we get a reduction in velocity through the valve trim. So we get the highest velocity at the, valve, at the inlet to the trim. And that's always the case because the highest velocity is at the smallest area. But then the, the, uh, we get an expansion of the trim an expansion of the fluid uh, through the trim, and we get the velocity reducing to, through to the outlet of the trim. So there's been a, a publication through the ISA, uh, Instrument Society of America, that gives specific recommendations for, for what's called trim exit velocity. So if we think about liquids overall, the uh, publication states that, that uh, in terms of the maximum trim exit velocity for a clean fluid, then, then the limit would be 30 meters per second. There are other recommended limits uh, for multi-phase flows or vibration sensitive flows. But in general, in simple terms, if, if we think about a, a maximum fluid velocity of 30 meters per second. Now, when we apply this to an extreme trim, we take this, this concept one stage further. And we also impose velocity limits at the inlet and through the whole length of the valve trim. So we're not only limiting the velocity at the trim exit, we're also limiting the velocity through the trim itself. So what we have is a slightly different velocity profile. So we introduce uh, equal areas at the inlet of the trim. So we can, we can control the velocity at the inlet of the trim. But again, we, we uh, expand the area through the trim. So we have overall reduce the overall uh, velocity through the trim uh, as the labyrinth trim. But by controlling the areas at the inlet of the trim, we can then introduce our own velocity limitations. So what we have when we compare it to the maximum trim exit velocity of 30 meters per second, by introducing velocity limits to the fluid at the inlet, again, that's the area which has the highest velocity. We can impose our own velocity limits. In this case, we, we use a maximum velocity of 75 meters per second. Uh, 
So when we compare these applications and look at a stack disk design, the labyrinth disk design versus the extreme trim that you see in the table on the right hand side, then essentially they, they have the same or similar features. They both have the same trim exit velocity. But the uh, extreme trim, as I said before, is reducing the pressure by changes of direction, by expansion, contraction, and via self-impingement. We have the first three stages that are equal, um, and then we expand after that. And the overall net effect of that, when we look at, a, again, a boiler feed water application, it is that we we have a, a on a labyrinth trim we would have a maximum trim velocity of 96.4 meters per second whereas we're using the extreme trim because we control the areas at the inlet we have a much lower velocity at the inlet and because we have low velocity at the inlet it means that we have less potential for erosion at the inlet of the trim. When we think about noise, noise, um, or, or should I say gases that flow through a trim, if these are clean gases, they won't generate erosion, but they will generate noise. And there's a lot of research being done on, on jet noise. Um, and essentially what happens with, with gas as it exits a trim is it causes these diamond shaped shock cells. And these diamond shaped shock cells, if they coalesce together, generate higher and higher noise levels through the valve trim. And it's a bit like the ripples that we see on a pond, uh, effectively like a pond here. But simply, if we can separate these diamond shaped shock cells, fundamentally, it has the purposes of reducing the noise. Looking at competitors trims again, there are different techniques for for addressing noise through through gas service applications. And again, we've got the labyrinth trim, which has the single flow path, which simply relies on dropping the pressure through the trim. To, to reduce the noise. There are other designs that, that use um, a method to, to separate the shock cells. And in these trims, that they have notches in the valve trims. And these notches um, uh, separate the shock cells and, and give some noise attenuation by shifting the frequency of the noise. In our case, on the extreme, what we do is we combine the two uh, technologies. Um, by combining the two technologies, we can get the multi-stage pressure let down through, through what we've seen already in the extreme. But we also introduce what we call a mesh into the trim. And this mesh gives us the, the jet separation. And by having this mesh and the multi-stage pressure let down, it gives us approximately 8 to 12 dB um, noise reduction over that of our competitors. And when you think about noise, it's not a logarithmic scale. Um, it's not, uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's not a linear scale. It's a lot more of a logarithmic scale. So, uh, 8 to 12 dB noise reduction is, is significant. And there's ch a simple chart here that, that gives uh, relative noise reduction uh, or noise levels. So, so for example, 10 dB is, is the difference uh, between a street traffic and a, and a normal television at, at low, low noise. So, but Otherwise, in, in terms of, of, of sizing the valve and selecting the valve for, for gas applications, we did a, a, a lot of testing with, with uh, different flow profiles. And some of these tests that we did here uh, are shown on the right-hand side. So we've got path A through to path D. Um, 
the, the path A is a basic flow, flow profile. Path B is, is the uh, liquid flow path for extreme. Path C is a flow path where we introduced a mesh onto the outlet to control the, the jet noise or, or the or shift the frequency. And path D is where we um, incorporated both techniques for, for reducing the noise. So overall, with these different flow paths, uh, between the, all these flow paths, we could get 35 to 40 decibels of, of noise reduction. And again, that's a huge uh, leap from, from saying having a jackhammer noise through to having normal speech uh, uh, or, or a normal television. So a huge noise reduction. And what, what we have here, whoops, if I skip back, is we have these um, fluid models, path A, path B, path C, and path D. And these are the actual tests that we did. You see on path A here, we've got these, these pulses uh, that are coming out of the valve trim. These pulses physically are generating high noise levels. In path B and path C, we're getting smaller jets just at the exit of the valve trim. But path D was the only valve trim uh, that we could use, which we could physically stand next to without any specific hearing protection, uh, where, where we could um, uh, use the valve in a low noise application. So as a, just to summarize on, on, on gas noise, gas, if it's clean, will not uh, damage or erode the valve, but it will generate high levels of vibration and it will potentially generate high levels of noise. So that concludes the presentation for today. As I say, I've, I've got a number of questions uh, that have come in. Um, uh, so, so for the valve, the valves itself, I'll address some of these questions now. Um, so the first question in is who is the main competitor of, Bla of the Blakebrook brand? Um, and I won't mention names of competitors uh, by name. There are many companies that manufacture severe service valves out on the market. They all have different techniques uh, for dropping the, the pressure, and some of those I've addressed. The extreme trim is unique. Uh, and to answer and, uh, some of the other questions, um, um the then um it's it's been the the extreme trim um well, <laughs> ironically uh what is the inspiration behind the extreme trim it it was um a managing director of of trillium going back over 20 years that came up with the inspiration uh and and yeah he 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 came up with the thought of a of a method of of eliminating trim blockage um and we developed it from there through through years of research um what are the main advantages of, of Blakeborough in this segment um the uh the advantages really are, are many fold, both in, in pressure drop control um, and also in, in velocity control, in looking at valve trims for specific applications. So for example, we, we've been just do, looking at a valve trim for feed water applications. It had specific erosion issues and we've looked at, uh, at a custom-built trim uh, specifically for that application to incorporate different trim materials for different hardnesses to, to look at erosion of the valve plug and, and design a specific valve plug. Uh, 
um, for, for that application. So there are many um, options that we have in our toolbox uh, for designing valve trims according to the, to the market requirements. Uh, next question is, is there any similar designs to the Extreme Trim? Uh, now, the Extreme Trim was a patented design, uh, but there are, uh, in recent years, there are some valve companies that have tended to copy the Extreme Trim. And again, I won't mention names, uh, but uh, yeah, some of these, these companies have started to copy the extreme trim and, and realize some of the advantages. But again, I, I won't mention names on this call. Um, uh, next question is, at how much pressure drop uh, do we start to require two stages, three stages, four stages? And that's really not an easy question to answer. Um, so as I said before, in very broad terms, uh, 50 bar pressure drop is, is, is a rule of thumb for, for one stage of pressure letdown. 80 bar pressure drop would be a rule of thumb for two stages. Uh, 105 bar would be three stages. These would be all on liquids, by the way. Um, but each manufacturer has its own its own design limits for for the number of stages. Each manufacturer has its own methodology for 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 design. So it would be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. It would equally be different if if we had different pressure drops. So so for example, if we had a pressure drop of fifty bar that we had cavitation then it would mean that, that, that we would need to introduce more stages of pressure reduction. So not an easy question to answer um, overall, but uh, we it's, it's, it's really a case of sizing the valve and selecting the right valve for the right application. Next question is, is there any material improvements like special coating? special grade of tungsten carbides that, that can apply to valve trims. Uh, yes, there are. Um, that we, we do manufacture the extreme trim in tungsten carbide. And if you look at uh, one of our previous uh, webinars on sand erosion, then we have discussed extreme trims in tungsten carbide. Uh, we can manufacture it in, in uh, hardened materials. Again, Inconel is a good example of, of, of our oil and gas applications. But uh, yes, where there is sand present, then, then we would have uh, tungsten carbide trim as, as an option. Uh, what's the problem reason that we are not able to achieve desired flow from control valves and boiler feed water applications? Um, in boiler feed water applications, then um, it depends on the uh, application and the station. We can achieve uh, specific flow rates. And, and again, this is part of the valve sizing and selection. Um, process. Um, some people, uh, as I said before, specify a 30% and 100% valve. Uh, it really depends on the application, but in all cases, we can achieve the flow rates. Uh, as I said before, when, when we, we have an application at the moment, which has got big magnetite and big blockage issues with the valve trim, and we're looking at supplying an extreme trim uh, because of those issues and the natural anti-block, anti-clogging uh, anti feature of the extreme trim. Uh, what is the best trim selection for dirty water service? Um, the first thing to know is, is that normally speaking, the, the extreme trim has uh, an entry of approximately uh, one and a half millimeters. So if you've got particular particulates over one and a half millimeters, then there is a certain amount of filtration uh, 
that needs to take place of, of that water. But overall, then, then um, for anything, any particulates less than that, then the extreme will, will allow the particulates to wash through the trim. As I said before, we might have to incorporate um, uh, 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 tungsten carbide trim uh, to eliminate erosion because where you've got particulates in the trim, the, the impact or the impingement of those, those particles will start to erode the valve trim. So we have to look at material hardnesses. Um, but overall, the extreme trim within those, dark, um, within those um, limits uh, can be used. Uh, can the design of the extreme be reversed? Um, flow will be from inside. Uh, yes, it can. Uh, we can design it to flow it inside and to flow it from the outside. So, for example, the one thing that I didn't touch on in um, gas services is we would flow it from the inside to the outside. This is to allow for the expansion of the gas going through the trim. But equally, we can do it on, on liquid services. But one caveat to that is that on liquid service, you we would have to be very careful because one of the advantages of the extreme on liquids is we get the fluid impingement in the center of the trim. When we flow it towards the outside, that, that impingement would take place on the body wall of the valve. So we do have to be careful there. And, and yes, we can flow it from, from uh, inside to outside, but it may be that the, the, uh, the potential for erosion of the body wall is much higher. So, so it would be a reason to, to not consider that option. Um, and yeah, uh, another question on, is there any material improvements like coating? Uh, and, and again, yes, uh, we, we could apply, we apply Stellite to, to the valve trim, etc. cetera. Um, so, so yeah, we, we can do a whole variety of trims for, uh, for applications. From our point of view, the, the key thing is, is valve selection, v having process conditions, first of all, then selecting the right trim and the right process conditions for the valve application is, is key. So, so we need to consider those things in terms of the, of the valve and the valve selection. Hey, Adrian, there is a last uh, quest, last minute question I, um, you already answered during the presentation, but would you please uh, repeat? The question is, what should be the preferred flow direction for feed, boiler feed water valve under the plug or over the plug? Uh, for, for boiler feed water, definitely the flow direction for, should be over the plug. So. Again, that's that's for the reason that I mentioned before that if we flew flowed the fluid under the plug, you would impinge the fluid onto the body wall, and that would cause a significant amount of erosion uh, of the body wall. So by flowing it over the plug, we get the benefit of impingement within the center of the valve trim. Uh, and the the erosive erosive properties are are uh, contained within the trim itself, and then simply pass down through the outlet. So so on boiler feed water applications, hundred percent that we need to flow it from outside to inside to to minimise the potential for erosion of of the valve body. It's all about protecting the the pressure envelope overall. Okay, I think that answers all the questions that I have. I'd like to thank you all for, for your time today. If there are any other questions that come up, uh, please contact your local representative uh, and, and they can feed the questions back to myself.
Uh, but uh, again, thank you all for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and look forward to speaking to, to some of you in the future. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a nice day. Bye.